Welcome to the House of Truth. Last last time we talked we talked about the wisdom of the cross. Why Messiah had to die on a cross? Not just why he had to die, but why it needs to be a cross in particular, and how this wisdom and how there was wisdom in that. Then that wisdom was, and part of that was to hide the wisdom of God from those who did not know the ways of God. So they would carry out his wishes. The day we're the day we're the day we're going to talk about the wisdom of the resurrection. If Messiah's wisdom paid for our sins, which it did, then why did then why did he have to be resurrected? He, the penalty, Why was salvation not, not complete? The work of salvation not complete without the resurrection. And understand this: we're going to begin. In Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11, verses 9 through 11, this is a song of David, one of the messianic, one of the messianic songs we, I referenced last week, along with Psalms 22 and the course in the course of the passage Isaiah 53, and several other passages that make this make the made the death plain. They also speak, but this, this one also speaks of the resurrection. And it's, there's a little bit of contention here. I'll explain after I read here. For therefore my heart is glad, my, glo my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For you'll leave my soul in hell, neither you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy, that my hand there should be, uh, that there are pleasures forevermore. And first of all, David's rightness, his heart's glad, his flesh is going to rest in hope. And what's this hell there? It doesn't mean the place of torment, like where the rich man went. But but Sheol, the Hebrew word, means the unseen place. And so 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 David was saying, "I'm not going to. You're not going to leave me in a disembodied state, even in, even in paradise, Abraham's bosom. And you're going to show him the." And you will show him the path of life. Because we cannot experience the fullness of joy in the right in, in those pleasures without a body. Now the contention point of contention is about this holy one. Some ra some rabbis have maintained that the holy one refers to David himself, while others say it refers to Messiah. Not seeing corruption, well, not seeing corruption. Neither, neither body was not going to decay. Now we're we get some more insight from the about this, some more perspective on this, from looking in in, in Acts thirteen, verse twenty nine to thirty four, where we're looking at the words of the words of Shaul when he's talk when he's, when he's talking. He's talking to a group to a group of um, well, he's in a synagogue in a Gentile city outside of Israel. And he's talking to this mixed crowd of primarily Jews. And he's, and he's, and he's gonna talk about some of these other passages we talked about and see how they apply to Messiah and show how they apply to Messiah. And we even feel what was written of him. They took him down from the again, Acts 13, verse 29 to 34 is where we're starting. They had written him, and they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. It was seen many days of them which came from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. We declare in you glad tidings how that the promise which you made to the fathers, God's filled the same dust as children. And he raised up Jesus again, as it was also written in the second psalm, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. As concerned that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he said this wise, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. Okay. So first of all, fulfill that was written of him. What we talked about is his death was written of him. And his burial as well. But also, but notice that Paul Paul also saw Shaul, the apostle Paul, also said emphasized that God would raise him from the dead. And that, 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 that also was written of him. Yeah. That, that, that's, that, 
And notice that there's many witnesses. And notice who these witnesses are. We'll expound upon this a little later, but from those that came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Galileans, but they came to him. And when? In particular, who witnesses death and also his resurrection. So they came, these, these are these Galileans who came with him at Passover. So came for Passover to Jerusalem according to the commandment and the law that God gave Moses. They, and so they came this, with this rare large company. And those people are his witnesses to this day. The day. Of course, they're all gone now, but they were witnesses at the time. The, what, the law required two or three witnesses to establish the thing, and you, know, you had way more than that, more like 500. So, and, and what's the point of this? That, they, that, that this that this that this raising from the dead, this resurrection, is tied to the promises made to the fathers. No, no, it's not Moses. The fathers mean Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he fulfilled them. And notice again that Messiah here has said, I, "This day I've begotten you." He was begotten the second time. He was begotten. He was, he was from the bosom of the Father and sent to the earth. And this might, you know, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. But now David says he's begotten again, and why? Because because when because when we're because, because when we're begotten of God, we'll talk about this more later. We pass from death unto life. And Messiah, when he was raised, when he's raised from the dead, passed from death unto life. So in that sense, he was begotten again, because because he raised him from the dead. And, he, he, and, they, and Messiah could go there because of the sure mercies of David. Remember, David said his flesh would rest in hope. Well, David, David was David was not without sin. And if he could, and yet God extended mercy to him. David did things under the law that that, that, that he des, that showed he desired and requ, was worthy of physical death. Like only with Bat, like the only with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, but yet God, God, God promised mercy to David. So if David's flesh could rest in hope through the mercy of God, how much more he that knew no sin could rest in hope? His flesh could rest in hope. Now, as we continue on in Acts thirteen and verses thirty-five through forty-one, we read that we. We, we see we, this. This gets, is going to clarify that first that first verse we looked at even more, even more so. Wherefore he says in another psalm, "Thou will thou shall not suffer the holy one to see corruption." For David, at David, after he had served his own generation for the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that though this man has preached to you the forgiveness of sins. That by, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things, which could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that which come upon you which spoke of the prophets. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish. For I work in your days a day, a work which shall no wise believe, though a man declare it to you. So now, now we're back to that psalm, and it's plain. That David was David. David fell on sleep, died, and was laid with his fathers in the grave, and his body decayed. So, thine holy one, your holy one, is not David. It's Messiah himself. But Messiah, again, he died. But God raised him. Again, he saw no corruption. Remember, it was the fourth day. Lazarus was dead four days, and they say, "Lord, he stinks." Decay said on the fourth day. Therefore, to not see decay, Messiah be raised. No, you know, there's a three day limit there. And indeed, he was raised on the third day yeah, before decay set in. And this, uh, and this is important because this man, not David, Messiah, is, is preached to us the forgiveness of sins. And notice, It's believing. It's believing this resurrection that brings us forgiveness of sins that justifies us because we cannot be justified by the law of Moses, and we'll explain that in more detail later. And and lastly, lastly, where he quotes Isaiah Yeshayahu here, 
We looked at last week, it's part of the hidden wisdom of God. They won't even believe it, though, spite all the witnesses there, there, there were still many of them whom were still alive. They could cross-examine if they so, want, if they so want, want, wanted to. But but people would not believe it nonetheless. And that wasn't the only witness there was. And we'll talk about that later, too. There's some other witnesses God gave as well to the resurrection that are still available today. Now, we now now we're now we're gonna go back to, to Acts chapter two, verses twenty-four through twenty-nine, right after the Holy Spirit was given. Right after the Holy right after the Holy Spirit was given, the, this the, to get some more insight to get some more insight about the importance of the resurrection, why the, the Messiah had to be why he had to be raised and when he was raised. In the wisdom of this. And we started with who, whom God has raised from the dead, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible for you holding of it. For David speaking concerning him said, I have foresaw I for, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore my heart did rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, shall my soul rest my flesh rest in hope? Because you will not leave my soul in hell, you will suffer your holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. You shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to David, the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher, is with us to this day. So, notice it was not possible. Messiah had the right to raise from the dead to fulfill scripture. He was that holy one David had spoken about. And, 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 and David's tomb is still in the, still in the area is in Jerusalem. I believe it's actually in the in the walled city to this day. The Muslims also considered him a prophet and maintained it long after the Jews were cast out of the land. And he he has certainly seen decay. There's nothing in there but bones. But his flesh rests in hope, and we'll just, we'll, we'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Why he says that. Now we're now Acts chapter two. We're, we're going to go down to verse twenty, continue in verse twenty through thirty-two. I mean, I'm sorry, thirty through thirty-two. And we're and we're and we're going to see them talk about some more about this about this idea about the importance of the resurrection. Therefore, being a prophet, therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that all that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to the Son of his throne. Seeing therefore he spoke of the resurrection of Christ as so is not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has God raised, wherefore we are all witnesses. Okay. Now hell again here, don't let that bother you. This is the Greek word Hades. The word Sheol is translated to from the from original Greek, Hebrew text, text into the Septu, the Greek Septuagint. It also means unseen placed. Okay, so David's not in a place of torment. You know, there's not some sort of idea like purgatory. David's down there paying for his sins to and eventually he's going to, you know, have him paid up and be and taken out of a place of torment. It's just the unseen place. He's never went. He didn't go to the place of torment, to be clear. OK. But God raised him up. And why? So Messiah could sit on his throne. A dead Jesus cannot rule over anyone. So Messiah had to be raised up for God to keep that promise concerning him, to the promise to David concerning him re, re, reign, reigning from his throne from the throne of David. Now we continue on in Acts chapter two, verse thirty-six through thirty-eight. We we'll read the following. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this made the same Jesus whom we've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, that God made Jesus 
the the resurrection lets people know surely that God has made him Lord in Christ. It's not just Messiah to save us from our sins, but also Lord to rule over us. And in response to that, when they realize when they realize they they they, they crucified the one God said to be their king over them, they they, they knew they was in deep trouble, and wanted to know what to do, and and. And this and the solution was to repent and be baptized. And then they could also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Remember, this is Acts 2. We're not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Ghost that every believer has. We're talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the result of them speaking in tongues. And, and it brought and brought this great crowd there to start with. So 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 the resurrection of Jesus brings people to repentance. It's necessary to bring to the repentance to, so they can be forgiven and be baptized. And it makes them and it makes them clean where they where they can be baptized, not just in water, but in the Holy Ghost. Now we continue on in Acts 3. Now we're gonna go to the next chapter, Acts 3, and we're and we're gonna go to verses 11 through 15. We're going to see some more application of the importance of the resurrection. As the lame man which was healed, healed held Peter and John, the people ran together in the portions called Solomon's, greatly wondering. When Peter saw, he answered the people, answered the people, you men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Why you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power and holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son whom you have delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, but he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, where we are all witnesses. So, so, uh, so, so notice now notice that uh, this healing of this man is connected to the resurrection of Messiah. And it's connected to that for a reason. Remember, I mentioned that, 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 that this is not the only that there that the only witnesses were not just the eyewitnesses, but God Himself is giving witness to the resurrection of Messiah through through, through doing this this miracle here. And it's it's no different. It's no different. It's no different than than what than what God did with my own son. For thirty eight years, I told everyone, Muslims, Jews. I mean, practice Judaism, not 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 people ethnically Jewish, but people who rejected Messiah. Jewish people who rejected Messiah. Atheists, atheists, Buddhists, Hindus, who what have you. That God raised his only son from the dead. When my son died, he was dead for eight minutes, brain dead. Not, you know, that, you cannot shock someone back from brain dead. God heard the heard heard the heard the prayer of the heard the, the pleads and the prayers of me and my wife and raised him from the dead. To confirm the message that God had raised his, he was my only begotten son, to confirm the message that God had raised his only begotten son from the dead. So the resurrection, the mess of the resurrection is 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 tied is um, witnessed to by by miracles, and, and indeed can bring them about, and can indeed bring them about. Now we're going to look at another, another aspect of this as we continue on Acts thirty and Acts chapter three, in verses sixteen through nineteen. And and one of those and one of those is this. Well, let's see what it says. And his, and his name through his name in his name, wait. And his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Nay, the faith which is in the faith which is by him that was given has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know not through ignorance you did this, did it? As did also your rulers. But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets that 
that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Okay. His name, Messiah's name, through faith in his name. This man's been made strong. The faith which, by, which is by Messiah has given this man the perfect soundness. Faith is necessary. The resurrection gave the man the faith that was necessary to, to, to be healed. This man was set by the, by the temple, by the, by the gate, by the gate beautiful, where most people, most people traveled in and out of the temple every time, all the time. But Messiah Yeshua had walked, Yeshua had walked by him, Jesus had walked by him numerous times, never healed him. One reason may have been he was leaving he was leaving for this so this witness could be done. But there could also be an aspect of the, that the man didn't really have faith in Messiah. Perhaps he thought that his Messiah walked by him and didn't heal him. That really Messiah just couldn't do it. You know, it was all a trick somewhere, the, the stories he'd heard. He didn't know he heard as he sat there on the temple, everyone going up and down. But he also went out and heard about the resurrection and heard all these things. And had seen Peter and John with Jesus and, and heard their testimony. He heard their testimony. It gave him faith to be healed if he had lacked it before. And notice what else, notice what else the witness of the resurrection does. It bring, notice those things which God showed for his prophets. That Christ should suffer, so he's fulfilled, but also the resurrection that was shown before. And the response is to repent, and the and the times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord are revival. And revival comes as a result of repentance and being converted. Your sins be blotted out. And it doesn't mean, he's not saying convert from the following, keeping the law that God said to Moses to, you know, some Jewish tradition, a religion like that, to some pagan religion. That they that they'll say, well, you've got to worship Mary and Jesus and bow down to their images, like Catholicism. But be converted, be converted to must to God. Repent. The Hebrew words to Shuba means to turn around, literally. To return, literally, I should say, to return, to return to God. The Greek word, the Greek, the Greek word is translated to literally means to change the mind. Because in Greek thinking, your actions follow your thinking. If you change the mind, the actions will follow. So be converted is talking about, is referring to changing the way you live your life. And it's the resurrection that makes that possible. So that revival may come upon us. There is no revival without the preaching of the resurrection. Now, if we continue on Acts chapter 3, verse 24 through 26, we read the following. Yea, and all the prophets of Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. You are the children of the prophets of the covenant of the covenant which God has made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in your seed all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So this, so notice another. This is not again not based on this wasn't some thing Christians add on later. It's from the from the writings of the the Tanakh of the of the, the Nevi'im, Nevi'im, the prophets. I should say Nevi'im, the prophets. And, and and it started with the covenant of Abraham. And notice that covenant was that his seed Messiah, all the kings of the earth be blessed. But it's going to start with the Jews first. You first. You first. And what is, and what is this blessing? The resurrection made possible? Because it confirmed that Jesus was the Messiah? That we could turn from our iniquities. To the Jew first. But not only the Jew as we shall see. But to the Jew first. And then the Gentile. The great, the great, the great blessing of the resurrection for us is that we can turn from our iniquities. 
Not just the sin, but the things that cause us to lead us into sin. And remember, 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law. Whosoever sins also transgresses the law. Therefore, sin is transgression of the law. Not every commandment applies to everybody, but some commandments of righteousness apply to everyone. And then you strip it down to those we've all fell short and, and broke. And we've all fell short of the glory of God and sin. And that's the only ones there were. Now, we continue on in Acts 4, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to, because not everyone's happy this man that was healed, as we're going to see. And it's also tied into the, re, the, the, the resurrection, as we're going to see what it brings. Something else it's going to bring. And they spoke to the people and the priests, the captains of the, of the temple, and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, came, which came upon them. And being greeted, they talked to them, preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them, put them on hold in the hold the next day, for it's now eventide. I mean, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them of the men was about 5,000. Okay, so notice, notice the, the people intended, the people, many of them believe. But not everyone's happy. And the, the Sadducees ran the temple at the time. And the Sadducees, by the way, who are Karite Jews today came from. And Notice that they're grieved that the, uh, uh, the, that the resurrection of Jesus is being preached. And the persecution begins. They're imprisoned. Remember Messiah we saw last week? God said he, God, the wisdom of God was to put his, put his people in harm's way. Uh, not just apostles and prophets, but also ordinary believers. And, not, and that persecution comes about because of preaching the resurrection of Jesus. But it's also what brought, what, what brought salvation. And mind you, and, and mind you the Karaites, like Nehemia like Gordon, is from the Karaites, is, is a descendant from the Karaites, and the Karaites, I mean, he's a Karaite, I'm sorry. And they're descendants of the Sadducees and proud of it. And we really shouldn't be listening to them because, they're, because, because they are grieved about the message of the resurrection. In fact, they, they in fact they, they teach there is no there is no there is no resurrection for anyone. Now we continue on in Acts in Acts four verses five through eleven. We continue on this response by the enemies of Messiah to the preaching to the preaching of the resurrection. In particular, we're gonna look at what we're gonna look at, we're gonna look we're gonna look what we're look we're gonna see, see how this goes. This, with, a tr with this trial here now. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and their elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John the Alexander as many as were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. When they had set them in their midst, they asked, but what power by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, you rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if this day we be example of good deed done to the, to the impotent man, by what means he has made ho, be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you ho. The stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now, in, the, in this crowd of elders, elders were... Elders were well generally over the tri over the tribes and and perhaps in, in, in clans and so on and so on. And they tended to be they tended to have to be people of um the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there were other people that joined themselves. The people includes also those who those who became Jews through circumcision or who or or or, or who were the God fearers we talked about before, who lived among the Jewish people in, in this context. Worshiped God, but weren't circumcision. So, but the rulers over all them, right? And and again, these are, but these are largely Karaites again. The people the Karaites came from, and they now they crucified, and not just them, all the people of Israel, but not the, of course, not 
in a sense, not the not the apostles and those following, not those people weeping for Messiah when he was being was being was being crucified, as I said before. And the truth is, we all crucified Messiah. My sin made his death necessary. My hands are the hands that drove the nails through his hands. But to these people here, he's addressing they had phys they were physically they had physically they had pressured Pilate into it and then physically brought it about and then brought it about. But God raised from the dead. So their opposition to Messiah is opposition to God. And it's and so the resurrection of, of Messiah, the resurrection is the proof that, that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Yeshua, if you prefer to use Hebrew to the Yeshua Aramaic, is the head of the corner, is the, is the chief cornerstone. They have been spoken of by the prophets. Now we continue on here in Acts 31 through 33, and we, we read the, and, we, and, we, and we're, we're going to see what happened after this trial. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, shaken, where they were, were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude that believed were of one heart and soul. Were, there's any of the things that were aught possessed of his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Now, notice they prayed, and what they prayed for was boldness. They were filled. Now, this is not me. That, 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 there's three Greek words that translate filled. And, 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 one, of, and one of them is sometimes a... One, one of them's over. One, one of them is like, in, is really should be the indwelling it's, or something. One, one of it's, it's domos means it. One of them, one of them um, means overfill like you've drank too much liquor and that's like being drunk in the holy ghost it refer to that and but this one is filled and and, and, the, and this one is brings boldness this is what john the baptist is he was filled with the holy ghost meant okay and they're and they, and this and they speak and, they, and, that, and that feeling speaks to the speaks with boldness what do they speak boldness about and they, and they now they have great power more miracles like they have with that with the lame man because the, because the, because the, because the boldness is also to give us to get the power to give bold witness of the resurrection, and the resurrection, the message of the resurrection, also causes people to become those who believe it to bind together them as one. Because Messiah had said, "By this all men shall know that you are my disciples, that you love one another." And when the Holy Spirit comes out, it fills people; they're full of love. But that happens as a result. That's that's happened to be a witness of the resurrection, also to be a witness of the resurrection of Messiah. So we see the witness of the resurrection of Messiah is this great boldness, signs and wonders, miracles, healing, great powers, and and our love for one another. And we're you know, and I would like you to notice that. Now, the people have been the people have been talking to at this time are the people of Israel. They're in Israel at this time. They've not. They, this is all so far. I've looked at um, two, three, and four was in Israel talking to Jewish people. And we looked at it earlier some Jewish people being talked to outside of Israel. But there's a lot. But there's a lot more Gentiles than Jews in the world, and then, and this is for them too. And we're going to look at how the resurrect message of the resurrection. We'll bring them to faith as well. Next, and we're gonna look. We're gonna, we're gonna look here in Acts seventeen, starting Acts seventeen, verses sixteen through twenty-one. Now, while Paul had waited for them at Athens, the spirit was stirred in them. We saw the city was given holy to idolatry. There were disputing in the synagogue with the Jews, with the devout person in the marketplace, and them that met with him. And certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, "What will this babbler say?" And others, and other, some other, he seems to be set forth a strange God because he preached to them Jesus in the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, and saying, "Set Areopagus, I'm sorry, Areopagus," and said, "We know, may we know this strange new doctrine wherever you speak is? 
We can bring strange things to our ears. We would know what these things mean. For all your things, a stranger prays at that time, spend their time with nothing else, but neither to tell or to, or to hear some new thing. Well, a little commentary on me, uh, my, a little explanation for myself here. I lived in Athens for two, for, for two and a half years. I've been to the Agora, the marketplace here. I, I, I believe I saw the, 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 the uh, ruins of the synagogue. I believe they found them. The, and, and, but most strikingly to me, of, my, of all the time I was there, I, I've seen where, they, where the, the Aeropagus met at. The but most striking to me of all was, this, was that last sentence down there, 1,800 plus years later, 19, about 1,900 years later, I guess, when I was there, almost 19, almost almost 2,000, it was no different. The people in Athens and those, and those who lived in them still want, still everything was new, was interesting, by interest of being new. So there's a, a certain curiosity built in about everything that's new. And this, and this preaching of the resurrection was new to them and got their attention. And now they're on trial because the same for the strange God was actually death penalty crime because they had more idols than were in the world anywhere else in the world at the time. And they basically just said, enough. One of the leaders said, enough. No more building any more idols. No new gods. And you know, so, and, and make sure people do that, they made the penalty death. So Paul's actually on trial here in front of. These the greatest philosophers of the in the world of that day, Athens was a was the was a center of philosophy, the cultural center of Greece, and the Roman emperors, many of them, sent their sons to be educated there by philosophers, and the best of the best of these philosophers are, are the Ara, are the Areopagus, the Areopagus, and the Areopagus is who Paul's in, in front of, and let's see how Paul does in front of the greatest philosophers of the world. In Acts 17, 22 through 27, we read the following. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are too superstitious. For as passing by, I beheld your devotions. I found altars this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all the things therein, sitting as the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, near worship with man's hands, though he be though he needed it, as though he needed anything, seeing gives to all life and breath and all things, and he has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the sign the times ap before appointed to the bounds of their habitation. They should seek the Lord, and have them may fill after him and find him. Though he be not far from every one of them. These superstitions is also very true today when I was there. And perhaps too religious might be a, a, another way to say it, but but yes, they you know they, they have all kinds of superstitions when I was there as well. But notice he, but notice what Paul does. He doesn't. He, he isn't coming out talking to them about the gospel, or about Hebrew scripture stuff they know nothing about. They are outside. They are outside the Commonwealth of Israel completely. There's not a mixed crowd, like we like when we saw him start. We talking to the Jews and about people in the marketplace. These are these are all idol worshippers who know nothing about. So he doesn't, he doesn't preach to them from the scripture. He, pre he, he starts off with their own culture to bring them. And, and they have this unknown God. They put an altar up in case they'd missed one. Just in case they missed one. Or because they suspected there was one they didn't know. They, 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 they had God for, the, they even had a God for door hinges, okay? But they thought, well, we may not have someone, you know, they don't got, maybe we don't got everything covered. There's, there's got to be a God in charge of all that, and they, so but we don't know who it is. So it's unknown God. So God starts with what they. So Paul, I'm sorry, starts with where they are. Through so the spirit of the spirit of God, giving him the wisdom and boldness to speak. He's not concerned a bit that he's on trial for his life because he because now he's going to show them he's not broken their law. It, but instead, he's going to make known to them the God they know that they they've been worshiping but didn't know. 
and this and he's not, he, where he's standing. The the temple of Athena is right behind him. One of the most impressive buildings in the world. And he's telling him God doesn't need a building like that. He's not confined to a building like you like you imagine. And he, we and we don't have to take care of him. He takes care of us. And his whole reason. Is he put eternity in the heart of man, a, a, an emptiness that people would seek after him? And that's why you have this unknown, this unknown God. So he starts from their own culture and history and context, what they all are familiar with every day, to show them they need there is a God that you do that you know exists, but you do not know him. And I've been sent, and I've been sent to, not, to tell you about him. And we're going to continue on with with, with his with his uh, with his with his uh, really a sermon, his disguise of the defense, here in Acts seventeen, verse twenty eight through thirty four. For in him we move and we move we live and move and have our being. Also, certain your own poets have said, for we are also as, as offspring. Or as much we are the offspring of God, we ought to think that God is like. We ought not think that God is like gold, silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the ignorance of, time, of, of the, the times of, ign of this ignorance God went to, but now commands all men to, everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world righteous by that man whom he has ordained. Wherever he has given assurance that all men and to be raised him from the dead. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, We don't hear you again on this matter. But, so Paul departed from them. How be it certain men clave unto him and believed among them, which was Dionysus, the Aragapite, the, 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 the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Okay, first of all, notice how Paul is, is he's continuous thing. These quote, people don't realize he's quoting a Roman poet here. He's quoting a, one, of their, one, of their old, one of their own prophets from what. In him we move and be, move and have, breathe and have our being. And then we move, or I'm sorry, live, move and have our being. He's actually quoting one of theirs. And he also quotes another one, we are also his offspring. Again, he doesn't quote scripture to them. But but remember, they're philosophers. Greek seeks after wisdom. He's, he's reasoning with them and using their own culture to get to open the mind, to, their, to open the eyes of their understanding. And now he says, and now in the past when you just grew up after God and couldn't find him, God, God, God winked at that. He, he, he let it slide. He didn't bring judgment on them like the way he did for Israel when they, when, 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 because they knew God and they would go back into idolatry and then God would bring judgment on them. But now they know better. He's commanding everyone to repent. And he, and it's certain because God has appointed the day in which God will judge the world righteous by that man, Messiah, whom he, whom God has ordained. And God has given assurance to all in that God raised up Messiah from the dead. The resurrection of the dead makes us certain that, 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 that we are preaching the right God. All the world knows. All I mean, the, the DNA is too complicated to have happened by accident, for example. Anyone who's true for themselves knows there must be a creator. But the resurrection of Jesus assures us that creator is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that creator, and that creator, and, and, that, and that creator will judge everyone in, the, in, in righteousness according to what according to what God says is right. Those commandments of righteousness that are in the law that apply to everyone at all places and all times, like do not murder, do not steal. You know, rape's never gonna be right. Uh, and so on, so on, and so forth. And and, and and how do we know this is going to happen? Because the one who's going to do the judging, he raised from the dead. Now we got three responses to this. Some mocked, some reject the ideal. I mean, the resurrection of the dead. Whoever heard such a thing is no, you know, they had no concept of this. They have scripture like we looked at. That even foreshadowed this. Some weren't persuaded yet. They were skeptical, but they, but they, but they, but they weren't like they weren't just throwing it all out either. 
They need to chew on this a while. But others believed him right away. So the message of the resurrection caused one of the judges, Dionysus, the Areopagite means, you know, that's one of the judges in the Areopagus, right? He's one of the judges. One of the people followed on trial of became a believer and started following him. He became a follower of Messiah. This woman named Demari De Demaris. Now, Demaris is, if I remember correctly, is in Greek history. She's kind of famous. And the fact that she's even up there tells us she was a woman of great wealth, power, and influence. But generally, they, they, they didn't let women even be up there to witness. But they let men, and that's these others. So, so now, so not only the base, not only the lowest class people believe, but some of the upper class people believed as well. And without using one bit of scripture, Paul was able to bring people to faith in Messiah by preaching the resurrection. With boldness. And, the, and that wisdom came from the Holy Spirit. Yeshua said that the Holy Spirit will put the words in your mouth when you need them. Hey, now we're looking at some, at some more that Paul, Shaul, the Apostle Paul, says about the resurrection. And we're going to start here in Romans chapter 1, I mean, verses 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of an apostle separated to God, of uh, separated into the gospel of God, which had appointed before his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, which he made the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, whom we have received grace and fell an apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Christ Jesus. Okay, notice, notice, of course, we've mentioned the resurrection of the dead show, shows that, that he was the son of God. And he was raised by the spirit of, by the spirit of according to the spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit was involved. And, and, and it shows that he is Messiah and Lord. But it's also what caused to be called caused Paul to be a to be a, a, an apostle. I talked about the calling of Paul and how how the calling existed in his life. And he was always zealous, but he was but, it, but zeal without wisdom is not good, as as Shoal, the apostle Paul himself wrote. And what changed it was he encountered the resurrected Messiah Yeshua on the road to Damascus. He was in Jerusalem. He knew about the trial. Uh, his teacher Gam Gamaliel today is one of the, uh, is still is is one of the one of the three considered much Judaism is one of the three great rabbis of all time. He's the one, for example, in, in the Seder established the three necessary elements of the Seder. And Paul was his and Paul was his, was his star student sitting at his feet. And Paul, so Paul's zeal was always there, but without knowledge, he was out persecuting the church and killing them. But the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, when he encountered the resurrected Jesus, that Jesus he'd known, had witnessed, perhaps even was part of that crowd yelling, crucify. Come to him, it flipped him around completely. Now he became an apostle to go where no one had went before and create congregations where there weren't congregations before. That is the work of an apostle. As we talked about, and we talked about when we talked about the, when we talked about the work of an apostle in the previous lesson. So the so the fact there's people that can even be apostles and create congregations was only made possible by the resurrection, in like marriage for the rest of us. Everyone who receives we've all received grace because of the uh, grace because of the resurrection. We all call to help bring faith to obedience of faith among all ethnic groups because that's the great commission, which was given after the resurrection. And we're all called. Remember, remember, 
They are called few or chosen, Yeshua said. But we're, but we're called of Christ, or we're called after him because of the resurrection. The resurrection is necessary for the spread of the gospel. Not only does it, it, it give us a message to spread, it also calls us to spread it. Is the reason we're called to spread it and gives us the and it, it will change us in, from persecutors to apostles like Paul. Now in Romans 4, 19 through 25, we read some more of the, some more of these some of these similar thoughts Paul has concerning the resurrection. And being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, which he was about 100 years old, near the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded what, what he had promised, he was able to also perform. Therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, it was not for, written for his sake alone was it, that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, Raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, but raised and was raised again for our justification. Give yeah, the him he's talking about here is, is Sarah. You know, Abraham was was impotent at this time, dead with respect to being able to reproduce children. His wife Sarah had been barren her whole life and now had gone through menopause. She's 89 years old. Her, her, her body is also dead with respect to be able to produce children. But God had promised him a son through uh, Abraham, a son through his wife Sarah. He had blessed Ishmael because he was Abraham's, you know, came from Abraham also. But the main, but the, but the chief one is is, is 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 through his wife Sarah. And Abraham did not. Abraham believed it. When God said it was time, he got right on. He got right on taking care of that. Him and Sarah, and she conceived. And because, and because he believed God, his belief was imputed to him for righteousness. He wasn't righteous, and he had never sinned. But it was his faith in God, his faith that God would do what He said, do what He promised, that He'd bring His body. Him and Sarah's body from, from death to light that caused him to that caused that caused that, that, that caused him to be counted as if he was, was righteous. The righteousness of God be counted on him. And it's not just that way for him. If we believe God raised, took the body, took Messiah's body from, from death to life, we are gonna, we are also we are also gonna have our our belief is going to also be imputed to us for righteousness. And we'll explain that a little bit more in detail in a moment. But, but and notice that our, he was delivered for our offenses. Again, he died for our sins on the cross. That was finished. But he had to be raised again for our justification. Because we can't, to justify it, to show that we, that we, that we really, that we really, we really that he really was Messiah, and that's what happens. When we believe he, God raised the dead. We're saying we believe he is the Messiah, and he in his sin he wasn't an unfortunate victim of the Romans, but he was there. He was there dying in our place. He that knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. In Romans. In Romans 10, 5 through 6, Shaul, Shaul tell, explains this a little bit more detail and some other things we talked about earlier, which now we're going to see in full and more fullness. Again, uh, Romans 10, verse 5 through 10. For, for Moses for, described the law, the righteousness of the law, that the man which does those things shall live in them. For the righteousness of the faith speaks on this wise, say in your heart who shall ascend. That is to say, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to say, bring Christ up again from the dead. But what says it? The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And then if you confess your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you shall be saved. 
For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and the mouth of confession is made unto salvation. Okay, first of all, I want you to notice he's quoting the law. Numerous times I'll point them out to you as we go along. Now, if the law had no has no application and been done away with, then neither do the writings of Shaul, the Apostle Paul, because he quotes it over and over again. He also says it's holy, it's holy, and his commandments are only just and good. In Romans uh, 7. So that's the first thing I want you to notice about this. And what does the law say? A man that does those things, a man that does keeps all the commandments of the law will live by them. And there's only one who did that, Messiah. But that's if we want to be righteous just by the law, that's what we have to do. And we've all have fell short of the glory of God in sin. We've all transgressed the law. So there's a righteous on the faith. And now notice he's, he's quoting the law again. Say on your heart, who shall ascend to the to, into, into heaven? And in the parentheses, there's his, you know, his explanation of what that's talking about. Bring Christ down from above. Or who shall ascend from the deep as they bring him up from the dead? So this is talking about don't the, the, the attitude of faith is, is saying, don't have these words of doubt. Who's going to bring who's going to ascend into heaven, bring Christ down? Because they knew a Messiah was promised. They knew he was coming from heaven. But this attitude of this attitude of who's going to who's going to who shall descend to go get him was 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 doubt in God's word and what He had already promised. Who's going to descend from the deep if he's dead? Who's going to bring him back? Who's going to bring him back to life? Doubt again in the promises of God, which we started off with, like in Psalms. Doubt. You know, in, in 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 the faith, the opposite of the faith Abraham had, that when that even though he was dead, they uh, believed that God would raise the dead, would, would bring him from death to life, so, so he could fulfill His word. And again, so and it's all quoting the law. But what does the law say? It's the law. It says, "The word is near you in your mouth and your heart." And if he quote, if he dwell upon it, say, "So you could do, so you could do His commandments." And what and, and what word is that? The word of faith. And what is that word? That word of faith is this: that Jesus is Lord. And it says, "Confess your mouth." And it doesn't mean just saying, "Lord, Lord." Why do you call? Why do you say, "Me, Lord, not do the things I say?" Jesus said. Another place says, "Not everyone says, Lord, Lord, to learn the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father." So he's not Lord in lip service, but Lord in reality. You confess to the world, he's your Lord, and living like it. And believing in your, and, what, and what's going to cause you to do that? Because you believe in your heart, God raised from the dead. You're not this doubter that the law warns you not to be. And because of that, you're going to be, you're going to, you're, 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 because you're believing, you're going to be kind of this righteous like Abraham was. And that confession is going to bring, make, bring you to salvation. And we're looking at how making him your confessing your Lord and living up to it, not just being lip service, will bring you to salvation in a little more detail before we end. Now, in Romans 6, 5 through 11, Shaul said a little bit more about this, about the, about the importance of the resurrection, the wisdom of it necessary for our salvation. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him, that the body, uh, the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not uh, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin, and if we be dead with Christ, we believe that he, we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. For when he died, he died to sin once. Then he lives, he lives. And he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, also yourselves to be dead and indeed to sin, unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, planted together in the likeness of his death, like in baptism, which is an outward expression of an inward experience. Our old man 
is crucified with him. That that we are not sinners saved by grace. We are we once were sinners, but now we're saved by grace. Our that sinner man died. We put him to death. He he was crucified with Messiah. That 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 that, that life of sin could be destroyed. And that we no longer serve sin. Because you'll never see a dead man sin. A dead man will never lie. He'll never, he'll never, he'll never steal, never commit adultery. Dead men commit no sins. And we're gonna be so we are to be dead to sin, but we're also to live with, to live with Messiah. As he was he was buried. And then he came out, then we came out of the wire. It was a, a symbol, of, it, was, it was symbolic of his resurrection. And when he, when, 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 he, when, he, when, he, when he came up, with, he that knew no sin became sin for us. But that sin was left on the cross and in the grave. He's not sin for us now. He lives under God, under the purposes of God. And so are we to also living to God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of the resurrection. We are to have a resurrection in our lives where that old sinful man dies and we come up as a new man that sins no more. Like, like as he told the, wo the woman caught adultery, go and sin no more. The resurrection is not just saying Lord, Lord, but actually living like he's our Lord and going and sin no more as he instructed. In 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17, we read the following. Now, if Christ is preaching that he rose from the dead, how shall some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also in is, is also vain. Yea, and we're found to be a uh, false. We are, we, have found, we are found false witnesses of God because we testify of God that he raised up Christ who he raised not up. And it so be that the dead rise not. If the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. You're not the resurrection. We're yet in our sins. Because he wasn't Messiah. And all he did was die because he, because he got crossed with the Romans. And, 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 and if he rose, so are we going to raise, be raised. If we're not going to be raised, then he did not rise, is what Paul's saying. And if he's not risen, our, our preaching is useless and our faith is useless. All of Christianity, using that term very loosely, all of, all, all of, all of the following of Messiah, Stands or falls on the resurrection. And worse yet, if we're going to tell about God raised his son from the dead when he didn't, we are false witnesses of God. We're, 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 we, are, we are bearing false witness against God himself that he did something he did not do. So the resurrection is the proof that we are not that our, our, our sins is not in vain. I mean, our faith is not in vain. It's also the most well-documented event of the entire Roman era. Is all of history stands or falls on it because of the techniques. Over 13,000 documents have been spoke, Roman documents have been found, many of them court records that testify the resurrection versus only 10 for Julius Caesar. The oldest one of those is a thousand years after the fact, a copy of, a, a copy of something at the best. The the, the 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 yeah the the Otis yeah the Otis, yeah the Otis one found the resurrection found Israel about three or four years three about three years ago now had a date stamp on a Roman Roman court record only five years after the fact that's extremely close for an old document to an event like that and the, and the Julius Caesar documents some of them only a lot of them only mentioned only some of his events like crossing the Rubicon are mentioned one time in one document. Now, if if, there, if 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 our techniques for determining history are wrong about the are wrong about the resurrection, there's no reason to believe Julius Caesar ever lived, or any of the other Roman emperors for that matter. 
I mean, all we can say is, well, someone built those aqueducts. Don't have a clue who, <laughs> because we can't trust history. Because our tech, our all of history, not only rely, not only does all of Christianity rely on the resurrection, all of history's validity does as well. If the resurrection isn't a, val a valid historical fact, then not, then we cannot trust anything to be. Just worth noting. Now we're going to continue on with Paul here, the words of Paul about this idea about the resurrection, about the resurrection meet that there must be a physical resurrection for us. Or Messiah could have been resurrected. And we continue on act in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 18 through 23. The name which Ross were gathered asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. In every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after way they, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. The resurrection of Messiah assures will be resurrected. And it had to happen this way. Death came through came through one man that we all that, were, that we all that we inherited death from, Adam. God gave man dominion on the earth. The resurrection can only come through a man, Messiah. And the resurrection is an assurance, and it means we are going to rise again from the dead as well. And no, and we're and it's the hope of our own resurrection. And it mean if, 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 if we don't have a resurrection. We're being, we're being persecuted in various ways and suffering, as I mentioned last week, that God, as I mentioned earlier in last week, that, or in the last lesson, I should say, that God put us in there in the way of harm's way on purpose. And we're miserable and we're just miserable because we're, we're serving all this for nothing because we're just going to die like everyone else and that'll be the end. No, the resurrection is what keeps us from being miserable. Our hope is that our, our our, our hope in Christ is not in this life alone, but in that we will be resurrected as well. And notice this resurrection begins with him being the first fruit and ends with him and his coming. It's not a, the first resurrection is not a single event, as I discussed before. It begins with Messiah. And we're told in Matthew 53, or John 52, that, that the tombs opened when he died, but after after his resurrection, people in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, were resurrected as well from those tombs that had opened, and, and, and went through and went through witnessing his resurrection. That's I mean, that's two resurrections. Those who are dead in Christ and sleep will rise at the first trumpet. Remember, when Israel is called the assembly, the first trumpet means the means the the protos, it would be the Greek word in, in, in the Septuagint, the first ones. The ones that have preeminence. In this case, it's the dead. At the second trumpet, the last trumpet, the entire congregation comes. And so also those who are alive will be caught up with him. As I explained before, it's in Luke, as Luke 21, 36 says, not everyone, only the worthy. And then, then, then the 144, that's four. Now the 144,000 are on earth. Then, then you see them in heaven. There's no mention of them dying. It looks like they too also were taken off the earth and, and, and given resurrected bodies without dying. That's five. The two witnesses come down. They're a picture of Messiah. They come down in Jerusalem. They witness of Messiah. They die. They're killed. Their bodies are the, dead for three and a half days. Then what? They're resurrected and go back up to heaven. A picture of Messiah. That is the sixth, that's the sixth phase of the first resurrection. And the final phase is the, is, the, is the saints who are killed for the witness of Messiah during the tribulation, who come who, who are resurrected right immediately before his coming and come with him. So the first resurrection again is not a single event. It's a, it's it's a it's in a single phase. It's in seven phases, beginning with Messiah himself. And he gives us confidence that the rest of those resurrections are going to occur. Or did occur in the case of the one in Matthew. This is the wisdom of God in resurrecting him. 
Now we're going to we're, we're going to wrap up here by looking at the looking at the words some of the words of Peter who he's who we talked we saw earlier in Acts two in Acts two three and four. Return to Peter with some of his words about the resurrection as well. And we're going to begin in First Peter one in verses three through nine. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to abundant mercy begotten unto us, and the living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an, inherit, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto under, under salvation, ready to reveal in the last time. Therefore, you rejoice, where and you rejoice, you greatly rejoice, now for a se- though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the trial of your faith, being much more fresh than the go that perishes, that we try with fire might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, and whom you have not, though, though now you see him not, yet believing, rejoice with unspeakable joy, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your of your souls. Okay, the end result of our faith is the salvation of our souls. But notice, we have to endure through through, through trials, through trials, and through, through trials and trip and temptations first. And how do we do those? Because we have a lively hope by the resurrection of Messiah. That's not for nothing. That we are going to get an inheritance, and not like an inheritance like a. Like uh, my mom died, she she left me some money, but it's all gone. That faded away, or or perhaps you inherit something, um, it, but eventually it just wears out, whatever, like a car, okay. Or you get or you get out there and get a piece of land, and there's been like some sort of a um, disaster, and it's got oil, you know, not not oil under it, but oil all over the top, but that's ruined it, where it can't you know can't use it for nothing, it was just defiled. But an inheritance that will last through eternity. That's going to be revealed. To, that's going to be, and we are kept by the power of God through faith. Under that salvation, when does that salvation come? It's it's not complete. So it's revealed in the last time. And it's like a friend of mine said, described it. We are saved. We're being saved, and we will be saved. It's like as if we were on a ship that was sinking the ocean into shark-infested waters, and, a, a, and another ship came by, a boat, a, perhaps a boat, and said, hey, g- come in the boat. Uh, come in the boat, and you'll be safe from the sharks. Okay, we are. As long as we, that boat starts heading, tw- and I'm going to take you to the land where, you'll, where, you'll, where there are no sharks. Okay, we're safe. Now we're saved from being eaten by the sharks. But we're only saved as long as we stay in that boat. There's shark-infested waters all the way to get to the land that's free from sharks. If you jump out of the boat, your shark's going to kill you. You don't even want to put your hand over the side of the boat. The shark may bite it off. And those sharks are like sin. But when you get to that land where, where, where sharks are no more, now you, now you are completely saved. You were saved the moment you got in the boat. You're being saved as that boat goes along. And you are, and, and your salvation is completed when you get to the place where there is no more sharks, where there are no where there are no sharks, and that's the world to come for us, where dwells only righteousness. So our t- journey is not done, as far as what we're concerned, till we die. Okay, we have to stay in the boat all our lives, and how are we going to have the power to do that? Because of our hope. That was brought about by, that we too will be resurrected. We will have pleasures forevermore, as David said, that we cannot even experience in the bodies we have now. We will be with God and be his, and have an inheritance with Him because of the resurrection of Messiah. Now we continue on in First Peter, one, chapter two, verses. I mean, First Peter one, verses twenty one to twenty three. We're going to go a little further down and look at some more. He tells about the resurrection. Who by, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God? Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth for, to the Spirit and to, and to unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing you love one another with a, with a pure heart fervently. 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which which lives for and abides forever. Okay. Now we we believe in God who raised Messiah from the dead and gave him glory. And that causes so the resurrection causes our faith to be in God. And because our faith is in God, notice we purify our souls. How do we purify our souls? Not by not by not by paying the penalty for our sins. Messiah did that, but by obeying the truth. And we cannot do it on our own. We need the Spirit. The this law of God cannot be obeyed without the Spirit of God. In Romans eight, it says the carnal mind, the flesh ruled mind, is not subject to God's law. Neither indeed can it be. But if we, but 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 but, but the spiritually minded will will keep the righteousness required of the law. It also says in Romans eight, and, and the reason is because as Paul as Shoal, the apostle Paul says, we have been given the spirit of Christ. Christ was not was not a sinner, a transgressor of the law. And we can also we can also purify ourselves by obeying the truth and not transgress the law. Because 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 of our faith and hope in God, because of the resurrection. And that will show itself an unfeigned love of the brethren, as we saw earlier in Acts 4. Where we love one another with a pure in heart. Because we're not we've been born again a second time, not of the flesh from corruptible seed, the word sperma. We read the word sperm from this Greek word for seed. But incorruptible, the word of God that abides forever. And that word tells us about the resurrection of Messiah. We cannot be saved and, and, and live right in this life and do what God wants and is pleasing and right in his eyes without the resurrection, without are believing the resurrection. And it could not have occurred if there hadn't been no resurrection. Okay, now we're going to wrap up with, with, with one last with one last thoughts from Peter here. 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 21. Or Petra, if you prefer the Greek, or Cephas, if you prefer to use the, if you prefer to use the, uh, if you refer, if you prefer to if you prefer to use Aramaic or Selah, if you prefer to use Hebrew, but however you like, this is what he says: For Christ has also suffered suffered for sin, one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but be, but quickened by the Spirit. By which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, which were sometimes disobedient, when once the long when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Well, the ark was preparing. We're in a few that is, and eight souls were saved by water. And the like figure in the baptism also now is now saved. It's putting away the filth of flesh and the answer to the good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Christ. First, I want to get this out of the way. What's some of these prison, these spirits in prison, the spirits in prison? Talking about under the earth, area called Tartaru. Uh, it's, it's, it's in there, it's in, there, it's in I believe, in Second Peter, the Greek, the Greeks there. And who are these? They, they, they were those who were disobedient while God, in the days of Noah, while God was waiting for the ark to get built. Remember, it took, remember, Noah starts at 500 years old, finishes at 600. It took him 100 years to build it. And during that time, the angels, the sons of God, married women, the, the daughters of men, daughters of Adam, and, and, and produced giants. And they were killed for this, as well as those giants. And so those are the spirits in prison. Well, Messiah preaches to them. And he also preaches to those perhaps in, the, in, the, in that place of torment like the rich man. While he was between his death and his burial, and his resurrection. But for us, the resurrection is, is, is what? Being put to the death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit, just like he was. He suffered for sins. But the Spirit gave him life, and so it is with us. And it's the Spirit giving us life. It's our our simple our own simple man dying to live a life a life controlled by the Spirit that saves us. Because 
just as the, just as the ark was a picture of baptism, it's not baptism that saves us. Because that's only, that's only, it's not washing away the filth of our flesh, taking a bath that saves us. But it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. To live in a way that's pleasing to him. And we would not have the power to do it. If it was not for the resurrection of Messiah. And that is the ultimate wisdom of God in resurrecting Messiah. So we too could live a life of godliness. That's all I have for this week. I mean, or this lesson, I should say. Until my next one. Shalom.